And now we're coming into the final part of our program here today. And that is, of course, live on live. And this Wednesday, it's time for a monthly discussion with our friends and colleagues from the Africa Report magazine. And today I'm joined by journalist uh, Marshall Van Valen. Uh, you're very welcome to the program again, Marshall. Thank you. Now, let's have a look at what's in this month's edition. We're going to have a look at three articles. Um, there are really three big features here. One, of course, is uh, an exclusive interview with Nana Akufo Adam, who is the new Prime Minister, the new President, should I say, of uh, Ghana. There's also a profile of Crystal Weiss. Mm -hmm. Possibly the richest man outside of the uh, outside, of, well, in South Africa potentially. One of the richest, yes. yes. If not uh, the richest, but uh, yet again, things go up mm -hmm. and things go down. And we also there's also a special uh, feature here on Morocco, and uh, of course uh, this is a good opportunity as well to flag up that you're having your debate this Friday in Morocco. Uh, that's the Africa Report debate that will be taking place in Marrakesh as part of the Mo Ibrahim Foundation weekend kind of get together that's uh, happening there. But first, let's have a look at uh, the Akufo Addo interview. What do we have in this interview that we haven't seen before about the uh, new Ghanaian president? Uh, well, it's really taking a, a deep dive into uh, his style of governance and kind of the issues that he's set out. Uh, he and his government have complained that they've inherited quite a lot of problems from the former government, uh, an IMF program uh, that's gone off the rails. And so uh, it takes a, a focused look at kind of the challenge of providing free secondary education, fighting against corruption, and also taking a, a good look at his promises to limit his own power, which is something that a lot of presidents have said before and not followed through Well, on. <laughs> indeed. I mean, he has his work cut out for him, but I mean, he's kind of got off to a bit of a shaky start with his credibility because there are 100, this is the very interesting thing in this article, there are 110 government ministers. Now, how can he justify this if he's trying to clean the whole place up? Uh, he's had a very difficult time of it because people look not only at what you say, but what you do. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the, the very earliest signals, uh, you know, uh, government spending on wages and all the sorts of benefits that go with being a, a minister are a huge portion of, of the budget. And he wants to commit to building uh, irrigation projects and a factory in every village. And so, uh, you know, a lot of it is uh, is wait and see. People are, he's in the honeymoon phase, but uh, he's got uh, to do a lot more to make people believe that, you know, this this sort of uh, inflation of government numbers isn't just going to slow things down. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the one thing that also uh, we have to underline here, I mean, he may be new to the international stage, uh, but uh, he is an old hack uh, in the uh, political scene in Ghana. Like, just give a little background to him. I mean, he's, he's been, he's stood before. He has, he has. He's run very unsuccessfully uh, <laughs> many times before, both as a candidate for uh, the presidential uh, primary uh, for the NPP, his party, mm. uh, and he's been the candidate and lost uh, to the NDC, the incumbent government. Mm. But um, he, his family is well steeped in in kind of uh, local politics, and he very much appreciates being on the campaign trail. And even as a lawyer under previous autocratic regimes, uh, have been involved in lots of uh, important political uh, cases linked to to politics. And so, kind of. Uh, like with with other leaders, with the Donald Trump kind of people asking how things are going to change once once he's in power and whether you know he's going to bring new people in or if it will just be the same old party hacks that uh, that kind of come in with every government. Indeed, I mean he also has uh, his work cut out of him for the, turning the economy around. I mean Ghana is very still very heavily reliant on its uh, you know primary uh, materials such as I mean gold. I mean there's also the cocoa production, which has plummeted. Mm -hmm. over the last few years. Um, what, what plans has he, what magic wand has he waved uh, to uh, put this, uh, to fix all of this? Um, well, they're talking about a lot of focus on kind of the, all of the infrastructure and networks that are needed to to give the agriculture sector, sector um, access to markets um, and talking about creating you know, hundreds of thousands of jobs in the agriculture sector. But that's going to take investment in infrastructure and uh, because of the debt that the government inherited, oil is an, uh, another uh, important uh, part of the economy mm -hmm. and the price of oil hasn't been cooperating. Uh, and so 
um, it's really looking at kind of key projects on, on the local level and kind of building up uh, at feeder roads to, to allow people in uh, cutoff areas to, to get access to market and things like that that uh, the government's looking to focus on to boost cocoa production and and all the other elements of the agriculture sector. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I remember when I met his predecessor in um, John Kufor about 10 years ago, uh, it was the, the great hope for the country was like the, the oil and gas fields just off uh, the off the coast of Accra. Uh, so really, they haven't got the uh, the glory days that they were hoping for, have they? The Ghanaians? Mm, no, no. And we also feature an interview with the finance minister who signaled that a lot of the deals that were signed by the previous government weren't up in the oil sector and in the energy sector, mm. uh, for example, uh, haven't been very good for the government and that the new government's going to look them over and see if uh, they can renegotiate them to, to make them better. But oil, with the timing of the price, mm -hmm. you know, when, when Ghana's oil came online, and I think it was about 2010, it was at the height of the boom. Uh, Happy and, days. <laughs> and new projects continue to come on stream, but the price is, continues to remain low. And indeed. so uh, a bit of that excitement has uh, has worn off. Yes, the, a little deflation mm. of the big balloon. Well, let's move away from um, that uh, that interview with uh, Nana Kufuado and look into another profile, or a profile piece that you've done here. And this is of Christoffel Weisser, mm -hmm. um, who is... Well, if anybody who's uh, been to Africa, there's one place that you cannot uh, avoid seeing, and that is, of course, ShopRite, exactly. the supermarket <laughs> chain. But uh, just give us a, a quick synopsis of who exactly this Christo Weisse is. Am I pronouncing mm -hmm. his name right? Yeah, yeah. Weisse, yeah. Um, so he considers himself, you know, he, he, he pitches his reputation on still being, you know, at his roots, a humble shopkeeper, and bought uh, a chain of supermarkets for a million rand and turned them into, you know, uh, a, a billion dollar company. Yes. And has relayed that into to many, many different areas. And he's not one of those flashy, he's not an Elon Musk, he's not someone who's looking to invest in the newest, brightest uh, sort of thing. Mm. Steinoff is a furniture company. A lot of his investments are in kind of not very prestigious or kind of uh, high-tech in areas. Well, even ShopRite itself, I mean, I've been into a few of them, like in Tanzania, and uh, I mean, they're kind of, you know, they're kind of, they're down and dirty, they're kind of funky. It's like, you know, they're just big, big stockpiles. I mean, there's nothing, there's no finesse to it whatsoever. It's like, you go in, you get your stuff, you get out. <laughs> it's not the secret to success, is no, it? No, no, well, uh, you know, with the idea of capturing this rising middle class all, all across the continent, mm. um, ShopRite is one of those, you know, it's getting out there and wants to plant its flag and be uh, the first. And for the most part, you know, there aren't many huge rivals uh, like that that are able to kind of get huge stockpiles of... Uh, Diapers or baby food or all that Nakumas sort of thing. is the only one in Kenya, I suppose. That would be the only. Uh, the only yeah, one, yeah. Really. So they've got a lot of weight behind them, and a lot of it's often a step up from uh, yeah. a lot of their competitors. Mm -hmm. Well, very good. But the, the the other thing is, well, he's he's there is some criticism of of him, however, that he's a uh, well, I mean, to put it lightly, he's a bit old school, and old school when you're coming from South Africa means that he has still got uh, a bit of a hangover from the apartheid era. Is that justified to say that? Um, well, there's a lot going on in South Africa about debates about radical economic transformation and kind of sure. one of the one of the phrases that's always trotted out is white monopoly capital, that when you look at kind of the powerful South African companies that are, you know, dominating the local economy and also expanding abroad, they're run by white people who got into their positions mm -hmm. under the apartheid regime. And so uh, the radical leftists of the EFF and Julius Malema mm -hmm. have kind of targeted him and... and uh, the Rupert family and loads of others to say, you know, these people are rich and aren't using their wealth to benefit uh, the majority population. Well, indeed, I mean, the statistics are quite interesting. I just see there was a, a recruitment firm, what's it, Jack Hammer, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, said that uh, black people only accounted for just 10% of chief executives of Johannesburg, of uh, companies on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. That's, the figures still say it. It's true, it's true. And looking mm -hmm. at someone, you know, Christo Weisser is a is a case in point that his children he's training up his children to take over from him and says mm -hmm. that you know this issue of kind of race in the economy is a political one and that the you know there are questions that business can resolve but also ones that 
fall to the state. And so training and education, he claims that, you know, uh, when hiring people, you know, they always have such a difficult time within South Africa finding qualified black people to hire. Well, I suppose, there's a, <laughs> yes, there's a, I mean, you know, it's, it's a vicious circle, I think we could say. It. Now, finally, we're kind of running out of time, but just to quickly, um, briefly, look, there is an also a special that you've done on uh, Morocco, which of course has joined the fold this year uh, with uh, the African Union. But also, this is a kind of a hook to say that you have your Africa report debates that are happening in Marrakesh this Friday. So just before um, we go now, we've only got about a minute, minute left, just tell us who's participating in this debate and what is the topic? Um, it's uh, run with the Mo Ibrahim Foundation. So Mo Ibrahim, uh, Bob Collymore, the CEO of Safaricom, and loads of other uh, people from business and politics and NGOs are coming to debate whether the recent developments in Africa are an illusion, whether the new gleaming skyscrapers really represent a change in poverty levels and education levels and uh, the way Africa's governments and economies perform. And so we're looking forward to, to the results of, uh, of that debate. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, we have Donald Kabaruka as well, who's going to be there. Yeah. Mo Ibrahim himself is going yeah. to participate. Have they chosen which side they're going to debate? Oh, yes, yes. There's okay, lots well, of... <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll find out when you're back next month because we're running out of time. I'm sorry, uh, Marshall Van Velen, it's great to have you on the program, Marshall Van Venn from the Africa Report. Well, from me, David Coffey, and everybody here at Paris 5 p.m., bye-bye. <laughs>